Today I'm going to do a deep dive into the Rosa Gallery artist's watercolors made in Ukraine. I'll briefly introduce and swatch the colors, give a little time-lapse painting with them, show a comparison with other professional watercolors popular with artists today, and discuss why I found them to be more similar to gouache than traditional watercolors. I'll also show some of the struggles I had using them and how they could be either weaknesses or strengths depending on your artistic style and goals. There are timestamps in the description for anyone who wants to skip around to different sections. Welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. I'm Leslie, and it's time to make yourself a cuppa and get ready for this total immersion into the Rosa Gallery watercolors. Some of you have asked me to try the Rosa Gallery watercolors that are made in Ukraine, and so I purchased this landscape kit and thought we could open them together. One thing that made me hesitate to buy them is that seven of these are made from two or more pigments. And generally when I'm painting, I like to work with paints that are single pigment. I personally find that they kind of play better in mixes. And those colors are the matter red, the yellow ochre, the bright red, the sepia, the olive green, and the indigo. And so I purchased some other colors separately so that I can maybe change some of those out in the future. These top two are not single pigment, but I always like to use raw sienna, so I was interested to see how it compares, and cobalt turquoise just looked so beautiful that I had to try it. So let's open it. It's a beautiful color, and right away I like the fact that there are five different deep mixing wells. And this lays down nicely. Let's see how this is. I don't like that this is up as high as it is. Let me show you what I mean. It should lay it all the way down. You can see how that is. Short of bending the frame, I don't know a way to fix that. And that's a problem for me because I actually like to use these tiny mixing wells. The Windsor & Newton watercolor tin in comparison opens up and actually meets the surface, which means that I can use these mixing wells and it gives a lot of stability to it. But I mean, it's not a complete deal breaker. If worse comes to worse, I can either take this off or I can fiddle with it and see if I can get it to lay down flatter. If anybody has any suggestions for that, I'd love to hear it. Even just playing around with it a little bit, it bends down more. They give you a nice swatch sheet, which is always helpful on watercolor paper. And the inside tray lifts out and here are all of the colors. I love the shape. They're a little bit shorter. They're the same width as a normal pan for like a Windsor & Newton. And that means they fit nicely in here. I really prefer this size. The way they open them is very different. They're like stickers. Instead of being individually wrapped the way other manufacturers do it. Ooh. I love the way they're filled in comparison to like Windsor and Newton where there are kind of individual little cakes that seem to sit in. These actually seem to be poured into the pan. And I like these little notches on the side too. That's sweet. So let's open them all and then we'll have a look. I usually write the name of the manufacturer and sometimes the pigment code on each of my pans, but I figured out something really cool with the way that they wrap these. On the side here, it gives you the pigment code and the light fastness and the opacity and there's a perforated edge where I can tear that off and then just stick it on a pan. The same is true for this side where I can take the manufacturer's number and the name and put that on the pan as well. And then just snap it into place. And then to take it one step further, if I remove these extra bits and it's sticky along the edge, but there's this little piece that protected the paint. I can peel it away carefully and I can put it on the reverse side of my swatch card so that I have an added record of that. Pretty cool. I noticed that they gave me two swatch cards and part of me wonders if they intended for the labels to go on the second one. But because I'm going to alter the palette and put some different colors in it, I decided to keep this second one empty for now. And I love the fact that I can have the swatches of the colors on one side and the labels on the other. And one thing I've noticed about the palette is that when it's closed and I open it, this panel is very high but I am, the more I use it, able to maneuver it down so that it pretty much touches the table 
And so I think that with time, this is going to become easier to use. I've already swatched the original set, and now I'll show you the replacement colors I'm going to use, and we can swatch those together. I'll be referring to the pigments in each color. For anyone who doesn't know, all paints are made from pigments in a binder to hold it together for painting. In the Rosa Gallery watercolors, the binder is gum arabic. Different manufacturers often use different pigments for the same name, so it can get confusing. For instance, some manufacturers use Pigment Brown 7 for Burnt Sienna, while others use Pigment Red 101. There's an internationally recognized standard of pigment classification which lists each pigment by a number to help mitigate that confusion. Let me know if you'd like me to make a video about that. To begin, these are the colors I'll be replacing. I'll be replacing the bright red, which has two pigments, an orange and a red, with the cadmium red medium, which is semi-opaque, but I have more experience with it. Next, I'll be replacing the matter red, which also has two pigments, with a golden yellow, because I like to have a nice warm yellow on my palette. The cobalt turquoise is made with two pigments, which I know I don't usually like, but there are two pigments that already exist on the palette in the cobalt and the cerulean, and it's so pretty. And I'm replacing the violet, which is very pretty, but not very light fast. I'll also be replacing the olive green and the green because neither one of those are light fast, and instead I'll be replacing those with the chromium oxide and the cobalt blue. Both are single pigments and have an excellent light fast rating. Initially, I planned to swap the sepia, which has three pigments, with the raw sienna, but the raw sienna has two pigments, and when I swatched it, I didn't really like it, so you'll see in the end I end up using the matter brown instead. I also eliminated the natural black, which has three pigments, and I don't normally like to use blacks anyway. I did, however, keep the indigo, which I regretted in the long run. I replaced the natural black with a blue indanthrene, which I don't have a lot of experience with and was excited to work with. And instead of the raw sienna, I used the matter brown, which again is a color that I regretted. It has two pigments, and I found it to be really heavy and muddy in the mixes. And here are all those new colors swatched out, and I was really happy with all of them, except like I already mentioned, the raw sienna. I found to be a little bit too heavy and brown. And I already had those pigments in the yellow ochre and umber, which I preferred. So I put all the new colors into my palette, and now I'm ready for swatching. I started by spritzing down the palette and then began with the first two colors, which are colors that I'm already familiar with. So the first is the cadmium lemon, which is my cooler yellow, and then the cadmium yellow light, or my warmer yellow. I do love the cadmium yellows, but it's important to remember that the cadmium colors are all very toxic, so you have to be a little more careful with them, and also careful about the disposal of the water when you use them. Next is the golden yellow, which is pigment yellow 110. It's the same pigment that's used in Daniel Smith's Permanent Yellow Deep and M. Graham's Indian Yellow, so it's very pretty and bright. One thing to note here is that Rosa Gallery lists this as a transparent color, but I felt that it was more on the opaque side. Next up is Flame Red, which is made with Pigment Orange 73. That's the same pigment that's used in Daniel Smith's Pyrrol Orange, M. Graham's Scarlet Pyrrol, and Winsor Newton's Winsor Orange Red Shade. But somehow it felt a bit weak and artificial, and you can see here how I'm really struggling to blend it. And that's a theme that I continue to encounter with the Rosa Gallery watercolors. They're much thicker than the watercolors I'm used to working with. They were very thirsty, and many of the colors tended to be a little more streaky. And that includes this next color, Cadmium Red Medium. It's Pigment Red 108. It's a color that I'm familiar with using, but I've never had it go down as streaky as it did here. Next is a cooler red called Carmen, which is a transparent color made with pigment red 170 colon 1. The pigment name is a naphthol red, but most of the naphthol reds that I've used before have been made with just pigment red 170, so it will be interesting to see how this compares. It has a pretty pinkish color that's listed as transparent, but again, this one seems to be a little more opaque. Next is the Matter Brown, which is made with two pigments, Pigment Red 101 and Pigment Red 264. It's a beautiful color on its own, but a caution to anybody using it, I did find that it muddied the mixes, so it's a color that I probably wouldn't add to mixes in the future. And you can see here that I did struggle a little bit to avoid streaking. In retrospect, I wish that I would have kept the Matter Red in this place instead. The next color is Chromium Oxide Green, which is Pigment Green 17. And I'm not somebody who normally likes to include a green on my palette. I usually prefer to mix them with my yellows and blues, but I really enjoyed this color, and it's something that I plan to explore more in the future. It's a pigment that's used by many other brands as well, with variations on the name Chromium 
oxide green. And this next color is called emerald green and it's made with pigment green 7 and it's listed as transparent but again it's one of those colors that I found to be more on the opaque side and also to be a little bit streaky as I laid it down. Other manufacturers that use the same pigments in this color are Daniel Smith Phthalo Green, Winsor Newton Winsor Green Blue Shade, and M. Graham Phthalo Cyanine Green. Next up is the very pretty cobalt turquoise, which is a semi-opaque color made with pigment blue 28, which is the same as my cobalt, and pigment blue 36, which is the same as my cerulean. So in a way it's a convenience color, but a very, very pretty one. The next color is bright blue, which is made with pigment blue 15 colon 3. It's a phthalo cyanine blue, which is slightly less light fast than the regular pigment blue 15 that's used in phthalo blues like Winsor Newton and Daniel Smith. Although I did notice that M. Graham uses the same pigment for their phthalo cyanine blue. Next we have cerulean blue, which is made with pigment blue 36 and is listed as a transparent color. And this one actually did seem quite transparent and it also is very grand. It's a really pretty color that I'm excited to work with. Pigment Blue 36 is made with Cobalt Chromite, and it's the same pigment that's used in M. Graham's Cerulean and Daniel Smith's Cobalt Turquoise. Next is Cobalt Blue, which is made with Pigment Blue 28. It's a semi-opaque color that behaves really well in mixes and is beautiful in skies. And it's a nice blue to have in a palette because it has less color bias than blues like phthalo or ultramarine, which means that it's not only beautiful on its own, but it's a really excellent mixing color. The next blue is Ultramarine, which is made with Pigment Blue 29, and it's a little bit unusual to the Ultramarines that I'm used to using, which are all transparent, and this one is actually listed as semi-transparent. And that's it for the first two rows. It's now time to clean the palette and finish up with the final row. And leading it off is Titanium White, which is made with Pigment White 6. It's an opaque pigment that I usually don't include in a watercolor palette. In this case, I thought I'd make an exception, and I'm glad I did, which you'll find out later in the video. This next blue is one that I've always wanted to try and never explored before. It's called Indanthrene Blue, and it's made with Pigment Blue 60. Rosa Gallery lists this one as transparent, but I found this one to be so dark that I couldn't even read any text through it. Pigment Blue 60 is made from Indanthrone Blue, and Daniel Smith has a color by the same name. The next color is Indigo, which came with the original palette, and I decided to keep it, even though it has three pigments. Those pigments are Pigment Blue 15 1, Pigment Violet 19, and Pigment Black 7. It's listed as a semi-opaque color, but I found it to be very dark and not surprisingly very, very dominant in mixes. This is a color that would be beautiful if you were going to use all on its own, but one to be cautious about adding other colors to. Next we have Yellow Ochre, which is a semi-opaque color made with two pigments, Pigment Yellow 43 and Pigment Yellow 42. Usually paint manufacturers choose one or the other for their Yellow Ochre, but Rosa Gallery uses both, and I find it feels a little bit heavy and do prefer Yellow Ochre as a single pigment. This next color is very interesting to me because I've never used a color that's just umber. It's usually burnt umber or raw umber. And this one is made with the same pigment, which is Pigment Brown 7, and it does seem to fall somewhere between those two colors. It's listed as semi-opaque, and I'm interested to explore with it. Next up is English Red, which is made with Pigment Red 101, which, if you remember, is one of the colors used in the Matter Brown, and is also the color used in Burnt Sienna. But this one is listed as opaque. I'd hoped it was going to be a little more like Winsor & Newton's Light Red, but I found it to be a little more like the Matter Brown. Like the Matter Brown, I found it to be a little bit heavy and a little bit too dominant to play nicely in mixes. But it is a very pretty color that would be nice to use on its own. And finally, we have Burnt Sienna, which is made with Pigment Red 101 and is listed as transparent. I prefer a Burnt Sienna that is made from PR 101 instead of Pigment Brown 7. This one seems a little redder than usual, but I'm still very excited to use it. And that's it for the color swatching. I've taken the colors that I'm not using in this palette and stored them away for safekeeping, and now we're ready to paint. If you'd like to skip ahead to the review and my comments and thoughts about how I think that the Rosa Gallery watercolors might be a little bit more similar to gouache, as well as some tips for how to use them, the timestamps are in the description so you can skip ahead to that part. I'll be painting on a Hanamula postcard and using the number 6 Round Rosemary & Co. Sable Blend Series 401, a number 4 Flat Rosemary & Co. Red Dot, and a small detail brush by Princeton.
and let's paint. Thank you. 
One thing I really struggled with that made these different from the usual watercolors that I use is the way that they blend. Normally I can put down a base color and then it dries and I can add colors on top and glaze over them. But for these, they functioned a little bit more like gouache. What I mean by that is water would actually reactivate them. So I wanted to explore them a little more because I think if you're somebody who likes gouache, these might be something that really appeals to you. So I've done a quick swatch and allowed it a few hours to dry so that it's definitely good and cured and dry. And I'm going to try a few things. First, I'm going to try softening the edge. So I've got my wet paintbrush here. You can see with this, there we go. You can see here that it actually moves the paint around. So I can actually pull the paint off of a section. And because I was approaching my picture the way I would normal watercolors, I ran into some trouble a little bit there. I thought, oh, I'm just gonna soften an edge, but it ran into other colors. So it seems that all of the colors are going to do that a little bit. And that's not a normal watercolor thing. I can actually scrub out all of the color and just move it around. So here's a swatch that I just made from my Winsor & Newton paints, and these are the same pigments and the same colors. Now I'm gonna show you how normally this would work. So I've got a damp brush, not wet, but damp. And again, if I'm pushing this on the edge, you can see that it will soften the edge, but it's it doesn't pick up all the paint. It'll pull up a little bit but it's not going to push it off of the paper. And so that's something that I really struggled with a little bit more. So I just did this, so it's just been dried with a hairdryer. <laughs> I can take a color that's dry, so we'll take this one, and I can just re-wet it, and then I can take another color. I'll take ultramarine since it's transparent, and I can glaze over that, and I can get an indirect mixing with it. So it'll, it'll create different colors and different textures. I found that I wasn't able to really do it with the Rosa Gallery. So if I take this French Ultramarine, same color, wet this color, it's already a bit diluted because it picked up a lot of the pigment. The layering felt a bit more grainy and didn't have as nice of a finished effect. But I'm going to go ahead and try all of the colors and see if they're equal. There were certain colors like this chromium oxide and the emerald green and the cerulean blue that when they went on were very streaky and I found them difficult to work with. And the matter brown, as much as I liked it, that one too was very heavy and so was the English red. that it really changes the whole appearance of the color once you kind of reignite it. It makes a bit of a granular effect, but it's also prone to blooming. and doesn't look quite as intentional as the original watercolors that I'm used to working with. Let's dry it. So you can see even when it's dry, it's created a lot of really different effects that are a bit unpredictable. So you might think that's a deal breaker. And if you're looking for a traditional watercolor, it might be. But I'm intrigued by the fact that a lot of these colors are already opaque or semi-opaque where other sets would have them be transparent. And I wonder if these aren't similar to just uh, a gouache paint. So I'm going to try some effects that I would use with gouache. Instead of re-wetting and layering a color on top of another, I'm gonna try taking some of these colors and adding them with more of a dry consistency to see if I can do some thicker layering the way I would with gouache. So again, remember these paints are very thirsty and that also is something that makes them a little more reminiscent of a gouache over a watercolor. Let's take this cadmium yellow light and I wanna take a really thicker consistency where there's not as much water, there's a lot more pigment on the brush, just the way you would with gouache. And I'm gonna see what happens if I layer that over some of these colors. Right, yeah. So right away, this is feeling much more the way gouache would feel. 
Let's try some other colors. I'm going to try one of these colors that are listed as being pure opaque, like the English red. And let's see if we layer that over some of the colors, what happens. Yeah, this is very similar to gouache. It doesn't completely cover the colors, but if I apply it thicker, it doesn't interact with the colors below. So the verdict is if I pre-wet the colors below, they're not necessarily going to play so nicely. But if I layer a thicker color on top, it can be quite interesting. I'm curious to see also if I take the titanium white, which is also opaque, and I thought right from the beginning seemed more like a gouache. And if I add some of that and make a creamy color, let's see how that looks. Yeah, these feel very much like gouache when I play with them this way. And I think what I'm going to have to do really is just do another painting with them and approach it the way I would if I was working with gouache. This ultramarine is also quite interesting because whereas normally an ultramarine is transparent, this one is semi-opaque. You can see how beautifully that lays over colors. In terms of glazing though, except for a little bit here and here, it's pretty minimal, but I don't know, this could be a really interesting medium to play with. Again, if I take some more of that white and add it to the French ultramarine and make a pastel -y color, you know, I can, I can really treat this like gouache. And this chromium oxide is an interesting one because when I pl applied the swatch wet and wet, it didn't feel like it was an opaque color, yet they list it as an opaque color. So let's see what the coverage on this one is like. Yeah, we're getting a better sense of the opacity now. Yeah, so that suddenly becomes a lot more interesting if I think about this as a more transparent gouache instead of a more opaque watercolor. It begins to make more sense to me because I can actually layer things on top of one another in a more interesting way. So some of these colors that when I applied them were really streaky and not that pleasant, when I apply them as a gouache, they make a lot better sense. And you're not going to get this type of effect with a watercolor. So if I take my ultramarine with the Windsor Newton and make a very thick patch of it, it will get me there, but I don't normally apply my colors this way. I like to use a little bit more of a wet on wet with my watercolor. Let's take this cobalt turquoise, one of our streaky ones, and then layer on top of some of these. I would say if you decide to use this as more of a more transparent gouache instead of a more opaque watercolor, you're going to get better results. And again, if you like gouache, you might really have a lot of fun with these. But if you like a traditional watercolor where you like to do a lot of glazing or layering, you're going to have a little more trouble with this unless you want to do thick layers like this. Mm -hmm.
try a wet on wet technique where I add multiple pigments into the same patch of color. I think if you wanted to play around with wet on wet and put your colors down and know exactly what you were going to do and then plan to leave them except for thicker layers over the top, it could be good for that. But in terms of re-wetting and adding another layer on top, I don't know, let's give it a try. Here it is dry and you can see the interesting interactions. And I was getting a lot of that when I first started painting the buildings. But watch what happens when I try to add a bit more water. See, it just moves all of that pigment into the space where I don't want it to be. No matter how carefully I try to do, to do it. And if I were to then try to add another color on top, it will do it, but it's a little bit more tricky. And you have to apply these subsequent layers quite thickly, or it's just going to pick up the paint underneath. You have to more or less lay it on top. You can see what happens if I try to drag the brush. It just, it's not going to work. I have to dab it in even though that surface was dry. So if I want to blend in this area, I'll take a clean damp brush and just try to blend a little bit. and it doesn't blend in the usual ways. It becomes almost a bit of a liability, especially if it starts to run into the other colors. You can see that is not the look I wanted. You end up having to go to unexpected lengths to try to save your painting. And I think if you got used to them, you very quickly become accustomed to things that you can and can't do with these paints. And here's how it is when it's dry. If I wanted to go in again with some thicker, more opaque paint on the dry surface, again, I could do some layering. I think these would be especially nice for people who liked a more abstract finish. There's a limit to how much water new layers can take without completely reactivating the layers underneath. I don't know, but it's pretty fun. It's just different not good or bad, just different. I mean, look at some of these beautiful combinations up here, but there is a more of an element of surprise with these, possibly because I'm just not as familiar with them, but they're definitely not as similar to Winsor & Newton or Daniel Smith or even M. Graham. I'm gonna try to push this a little more. I know I'll probably be sorry, but I'm gonna try to introduce a little bit more color into here. And while this is still wet, Let's see what happens if I just spritz it. I noticed that on my swatch card, this was close to my palette and the chromium oxide got sprayed a few times and I like the effect that it created. Yeah, I don't know about that. Let's try to push that up a little bit. Yeah, see it's, it's pulling too much of the paint up and creating a little white patch that I'm gonna probably want to go over again later. So it becomes a little bit of a cycle of trying to not mess it up underneath and if you do you have to then go in and add a thicker layer on top which is definitely possible but you're not going to get the transparency in the same way as you will with something like Windsor & Newton. I've dried this and you can see that it's created some nice granulating effects but here where I tried to reintroduce some color it just created a bit of a muddy blob. I'm going to go in with an opaque color. I'll add a little dash of blue and I'll try to disguise that. So this is a different style than I normally use, which doesn't make it bad. In fact, sometimes you can learn new and exciting things when you experiment with new media. It's a bit better. So you can see I have very different looks in both paintings using different kinds of techniques. So this has been my foray into the Rosa Gallery watercolors. Let me know in the comments what you think. Have you used them before? Would you use them? What are your thoughts about them? And as always, have a beautiful day and happy painting.